Hi everyone, and welcome to Joe Reviews. Today I'll be discussing the top 12 things to know about Starlink. I'll cover some of my experiences with it over the last 20 months and discuss some topics that you may want to know about before ordering. Also be sure to check out my other video on Starlink where I did an in-depth review including the setup process. And if you find this video helpful, please subscribe. Okay, starting out with the top question I get, how much does Starlink cost? The answer to that is, it depends. There are basically four plans to choose from. The most popular is probably the standard plan. This is what most typical households will use. Under this plan, the hardware, which is the dish and router with necessary cables, will cost you $599. The monthly plan will cost anywhere from $90 a month in high availability areas to $120 a month. This is the plan I have. I pay the $120 a month. Starlink doesn't list where the high availability areas are, so you'd have to check their website if your address qualifies. Then there's a priority plan. This used to be called the business plan. It's meant for businesses and people who require more data. Under this plan, you have access to faster speeds and typically experience lower latency. Hardware under this plan runs $2,500 and monthly price can range from $250 to $1,500 depending on how much priority data you choose. If you go through your allotment of priority data, then you go back to the standard data which would have similar speeds as that on the standard plan. Standard and priority are meant to be used in one location, while the mobile and mobile priority plans are meant to be used for people who travel and can be used around the world. The regular mobile plan hardware costs the same as the standard plan at $599. The monthly rate is higher at $150 if you plan to use it within your continent, otherwise it's $200 a month for global coverage. The mobile priority plan is the most expensive plan. Hardware costs $2,500 and the monthly plan costs anywhere from $250 a month to $5,000 depending on how much data you need. Other than the priority data, the main difference between mobile and mobile priority is that with mobile priority, you can use Starlink while in motion. Starlink doesn't publicly state what percentage of people use each plan. I think it'd be safe to assume that the standard plan is their most popular, followed by the mobile plan, and then the two more expensive plans after that. Moving on to where Starlink is available. For almost anyone, it's easy to check if Starlink is available at your location. Just go to the Starlink website and enter in your address. As you can see by this map, it's widely available throughout the US, so much so that even retailers are carrying the kits such as Home Depot, Best Buy, and a few others. Elsewhere around the globe, Starlink is widely available in Europe, Australia, and South America. Not too many Asian and African countries have access yet, but potentially more places coming online in 2024. Obviously, some countries like Russia and North Korea will probably never see the service, but then again, maybe they will someday. So we covered pricing and we covered where Starlink is available. Another common question is what kind of download speeds do you get? This could depend on which service plan you choose. As you can see, there are some differences between each plan for download and upload speeds, as well as latency. Most people will see speeds between 25 and 100 megabits per second. I often see speeds at my place above 100 and rarely anything below 25. For me, this is good enough to have multiple people online at once in my household and not experience poor service. The upload and latency speeds they advertise are pretty spot on for what I've been experiencing. On to reliability. So far, reliability of my Starlink system has been excellent. Over the last 20 months of owning Starlink, I can only think of two times where there was an internet outage of 20 minutes or more. The last major outage happened on September 12th. Internet was down for about an hour. The outage was system-wide, so pretty much everyone with Starlink wasn't getting online. You can go into the Starlink app and see how many outages you've experienced in the last 12 hours. Typically, the only outages I receive are those that are less than than one second. No matter your internet provider, at some point you'll experience some kind of network interruption. In my experience, Starlink has proven to be more reliable than my previous broadband internet provider. Another question that comes up is what happens if you move or want to sell your house? What happens to your Starlink? There are two options. If you're moving to a place where you don't need Starlink, you can sell your hardware and transfer ownership. All you must do is log into your account, remove Starlink from your account, and you can send an activation email to the new owner. Otherwise, if you want to take Starlink with you when you move, you just log into your account and enter in the new service address where you'll use Starlink. Just know that when you change service address, you may not be able to return to your original service address. This keeps people from traveling with just a standard subscription. You'd have to upgrade to the mobile subscription if you move around a lot. Also, Starlink states that if you use Starlink outside of the service address you have listed, a satellite will not be scheduled to serve you and you may not receive internet. Moving on to the Starlink router. I think for a router, they did a great job with the overall look and design. If you're wondering about the illustration on the router, it's the transfer orbit from Earth to Mars. The router only has two ports, one for power and the other to connect to the dish. It's IP54 rated, but says configured for indoor use. In my last video on Starlink, I talked about having it outside when I first got it in February in Wisconsin. 
it performed just fine. If you're looking to use your own router, you can do this by putting the Starlink router in bypass mode and purchasing the ethernet adapter. This allows you to set up your own mesh network. Just note that when you use a third party router, you do lose some functionalities of the app. As you can see, when I open my app, I can't see which devices are on my network. You also lose the function of setting up a sleep schedule by putting Starlink into bypass mode. I think most people would be fine without both these features. More than likely, you can see who's on your local network with the app for your third party router. And I don't think most people would use the sleep mode anyways. If you don't want to use a third party router to set up a mesh network, you can buy another router from Starlink to accomplish this. In my experience, the range on the Starlink router isn't great. This might change soon as Starlink has just introduced the third gen router to a select group of people. This promises better range and potentially faster speeds. Another common question is, does Starlink have data caps? And the answer to that is not really, but kind of. In November of 2022, Starlink stated that there would be data caps for standard service, where if a user went over one terabyte of data in a month, they would see degraded service. They then changed this in May of 2023, stating that there wouldn't be any cap at one terabyte. However, when you read their fair use policy, it states that if someone consistently exceeds a lot of bandwidth for a typical user, Starlink may reduce that user's speed. It doesn't say how much bandwidth is figured for a typical user, but it'd probably be safe to say you'd have at least a terabyte to work with in a month based off their original data cap. So while technically there isn't a data cap, if you do use quite a bit of data somewhere over a terabyte in a month, you could possibly see reduced speeds. Next up, customer service. I've had a few instances where I've needed to reach out to customer service. I go into more detail into these experiences in my other video where I review Starlink. Starlink really tries to encourage users to troubleshoot issues on their own. The way they accomplish this is if you want to contact customer service, first you have to go to their support page, then you click on the topic you need help with. After going through their troubleshooting steps, at the bottom will be a thumbs up and a thumbs down button. If your problem still isn't resolved, then you have to click on the thumbs down button and create a ticket. You describe your issue and submit it. Then you wait for a reply and the wait time for a reply can vary. I was once offline due to a faulty cable. I didn't know that was a reason at the time, but I just guessed and ordered another. I had contacted support the day of the outage and it took three weeks to hear back from them. The same issue with the cable happened again a couple months later. This time I received an automated response in about five minutes saying they would send me a new cable. There is no telephone number to reach support. You can only create a ticket. So while it's not the ideal setup for customer service, it makes sense why they have it set up this way. They're encouraging the customer to try and figure out the issue first, to do the bare minimum, like turning on and off Starlink or resetting the system, which usually takes care of more than half the issues before contacting support. Your best bet to get a hold of someone is to go into support, click the thumbs down button and create a ticket. Another question I get quite a bit is how does Starlink perform in bad weather? I will say in most conditions, it holds up well. For me, the only time it doesn't perform the best is when it rains hard. If we get a thunderstorm where it downpours with heavy rain, my system will go out until the rain lightens up. This is what I experience, but I've talked to some of my neighbors and they don't have that problem. It might just be something with my dish or the way it's mounted that causes mine to be more sensitive to rainstorms. In other conditions, such as snowstorms or strong winds, I've had no issues. The reason Starlink performs well in winter is because of the snow melt feature for the dish. You can choose to either have it on automatic, which is what I have mine set as, or you can have it preheat so it does a better job of resisting snow buildup, or you can turn that feature out completely. The automatic snow melt setting does a great job of melting snow. I've only had one experience where the preheat option would have been a better choice. We had a day where it had been raining and then it gradually cooled throughout the day, causing ice to build up on the dish. I don't think it started heating soon enough and the internet was intermittent for about an hour until the ice melted off the dish. Moving on to another common question I see is how does Starlink work? How is it different from other satellite internet providers? I won't get too technical as there are some other great videos out there that really get into how it works. At the time this video was released, Starlink has about 4,750 satellites orbiting Earth. They orbit the Earth at a distance of about 550 kilometers. Other internet satellite providers have satellites that orbit at a distance of about 36,000 kilometers. Due to Starlink's proximity to Earth, it needs more satellites to cover the same area compared to a satellite that's farther away. That's the trade-off of having low Earth orbit satellites, you need more to cover an area. However, the time it takes for the signal to go from the satellite to your dish is significantly quicker. This reduces latency to about 25 milliseconds versus 650 milliseconds for other satellite internet providers. Lower latency allows for the ability to game online and a better overall experience while on the internet. Next thing to know is who is Starlink intended for? The main market for Starlink are people who live in rural areas. It's not designed for densely populated areas for a couple reasons. One is if you have too many Starlink dishes near one another, you would see degraded service. Another reason is in larger cities, there are usually too many obstructions for the dish to get a clear line of sight to the sky. 
Really, there isn't much of a reason to own Starlink in a metro area. You'd probably have more than enough choices for high-speed internet at lower costs than Starlink. Final thing to discuss is what's in store for the future for Starlink. As mentioned before, they're coming out with their next-gen router, which should provide better speeds and range compared to previous generation routers. Starlink is also launching Gen 2 satellites. These satellites are bigger than the previous generation of satellites, which means with every launch, they can't send up 60 satellites at a time like they used to. They're only launching about 20 to 25 Gen 2 satellites satellites at a time due to their larger size. This will change once SpaceX deploys Starship, their massive rocket that will be able to launch over 100 of the Gen 2 satellites per launch. When that will exactly happen is unclear at the moment, but as long as they get Starship to work and are able to launch more of the Gen 2 satellites, Starlink users should eventually see even faster speeds and lower latency. All right, so that's my list of 12 things to know about Starlink. If there's something I haven't covered, leave me a comment below. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.